This is our last of the year and we will be reconvening uh, either in late January or early February. And I also want to thank uh, Winston Beauchamp and uh, Doug Lavero who are our guests here today, as well as of course our speaker, General Raymond, and our introduction, introductory uh, General T. Um, the series began in 2014. This is its third year. We'll be beginning our fourth year next year. Um, General Teague, as many of you know, is the Director of Space Programs, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Acquisition. He directs the development and purchasing of space programs to Air Force Major Commands, Product Centers, and Laboratories. Uh, he has been a guest at our series for many times and also has been a speaker and we'll hopefully have him again next year. And I want to uh, welcome everybody here from our friends from Brazil and Japan, among our other uh, foreign uh, friends and partners. I also want to thank my friend Kath Ryan, who was with Colorado Springs and partners. So I want to thank General Raymond's staff, who did an extraordinary job in helping put this together. And I would also be remiss not to uh, let you all know, uh, Abby is our AFA person who handles our external affairs, Abby Gillette and really remarkable job that she does in helping put all this together. And also want to thank uh, the staff here at the Capitol Hill Club. This is the 52nd event we have done this year on various things and they do an extraordinary job. So with that, would you all welcome Major General Roger T. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, coming out. A great turnout this morning in uh, honor of uh, General Raymond, and we sure appreciate it. Uh, the continued support, certainly by the Mitchell Institute. Peter, your leadership, uh, Kath, thank you so much for being able to pull this together. It really makes a difference to help uh, spur the conversation and, and the dialogue uh, and grow the awareness of the critical role that our space assets provide. Um, we are sobered uh, in remembrance this week uh, that this was the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, an amazing an event, uh, certainly uh, one that uh, we all remember and certainly will be remembered in infamy uh, where we lost uh, five out of eight of our battleships, um, 2,400 lives, another 1,200 were injured. It certainly was a, a very difficult time in our nation's history uh, and a lot of heroes were born on that day. Um, similarly, uh, many of you may have seen the uh, report last week on CNN, um, a conversation that's starting to gain a lot of public traction uh, with regard to the threats that we now face in space. Um, I find that interesting, not only with that report, but as well the report that we saw a year ago on uh, 60 Minutes, uh, growing public awareness on the challenges that we face in space. Um, and fortunately, we've got great leaders like General Raymond who are focused on this with uh, a laser precision to make sure that we won't ever experience that space Pearl Harbor, to ensure that we're always prepared. Um, and these kinds of dialogues help promote continued responsibility and focus on our space enterprise vision and making sure that we will be prepared should an adversary choose to uh, engage on us. Having taken command just a few weeks ago, General Raymond is responsible for organizing, equipping, training, and maintaining mission-ready space and cyberspace forces and capabilities for North American Aerospace De uh, Defense Command, U.S. Strategic Command, and other combatant commands around the world. He oversees the Air Force network operations, manages a global network of satellite command and control, communications, and missile warning, and space launch facilities, and is responsible for system development and acquisition. Air Force Space Command consists of 38,000 proud space and cyber professionals assigned to 134 locations worldwide. General Raymond was 
a proud graduate in 1984 of the Harvard of the South, <laughs> Clemson, did I get that right? A little southern drawl uh, to that. And he also holds a couple of master's degree. But as you all know, he's a warfighter's warfighter. He's commanded at every level, including the 5th Space Surveillance Squadron at RFA, RAF Feltwell, the 30th Operations Group at Vandenberg. He was also the Director of Space Forces uh, in Southwest Asia and commanded the 21st Space Wing at Peterson. He's also served as Vice Commander of 5th Air Force and Deputy Commander of 13th Air Force at Yokota Air Base, Japan. And he's commanded 14th Air Force and served as the JFCC Space for STRATCOM. And he's recently just completed tour as our first non-rated headquarters Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to a great friend, the commander of Air Force Space Command, and the number one fan of the number two uh -huh. rated football team. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good morning. It is really, really great to be here. Thanks, thanks very much for the opportunity. Roger, thank you for those kind remarks, all except the last sentence was really good. Uh, probably longer than my speech, but that's okay. Uh, thank you. It, it's uh, always, always good to be with you. I also would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Peter and the Mitchell Institute uh, for doing this. I think this is my third opportunity to, to chat uh, with this with this uh, breakfast. There are always great conversations. I always look forward to it, and it's, it's really a privilege, a privilege to be here. I also want to uh, thank uh, our friends from Brazil and, and Japan and, and other allied partners that are here, and it's great to see you all again as well. As mentioned, I've been in my current job for about six weeks. Uh, I couldn't be more excited, absolutely more excited for the opportunity to, to command Air Force Space Command. It's like going home. And, I, and it's it, I can't be more excited for a few reasons. I gave a speech. I, I started. I can't. I probably can't use this slide very much anymore because I'm getting six weeks. You're kind of not the new guy anymore. But um, I, well, usually, uh, when I give a briefing, my first slide is I'm really excited to be here. And the the main reason, the first reason why, and the slide is a picture of Beltway traffic <laughs> and, on one half of the slide, and then the other half of the slide is the view from my office of the Front Range and Pikes Peak, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's just a great place to be. Um, uh, secondly, though, this is a really, really exciting time to be in the space and cyber business. Uh, it's in my 30-something years of service, I have never seen a time where there is this much excitement uh, around the missions that, uh, that we operate in. We face a lot of challenges in both the space and cyber domains, and we're really working hard to make sure that we stay ahead of those uh, of our strategic competitors. As I tell my team, we simply cannot whiff. We've got to get this right. The security of our nation depends, uh, demands that we do so. The, the, the final reason why uh, I'm really excited to be in this job and the exciting time that we have is, Roger mentioned the, the anniversary of, of uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's the 70th anniversary of our Air Force. Uh, this year, on the, on, in September, will be the 70th anniversary of our Air Force. And, for Air Force Space Command Airmen, it's the 35th anniversary of, of Air Force Space Command. On 1 September of 1982 is when our command was born. I, I have in my speech, for those that don't know, I'm a proud uh, graduate of the Harvard of the South. Uh, the reason why I bring that up, though, uh, this morning, and really, you know the difference between Harvard and Harvard of the South? Harvard of the South has a really good football team. But, uh, <laughs> and I actually, for General Heighton at our change of command, I actually said he's from the Clemson of the North. I've turned that around a little bit now. Uh, <laughs> because we've just completely over, overlapped Harvard and everything that we do. Um, but I, the reason why I mentioned, the reason why I mentioned, I'll tell you another funny story. This honest to goodness truth. Uh, my son, who's a junior in high school, I take him down to Clemson every year to get him indoctrinated and in wanting to go to that school. And he's been really, really good. And I was out at, at Vandenberg and got to interact with some folks from Stanford. And uh, I was telling Gary, I said, man, Stanford, they're some really smart people. And, uh, and when we were coming back, we went up to San Francisco, we were coming back and said, let's drive through Stanford, drove through Stanford, and we get home. He said, Dad, you know, if I don't get into Clemson, maybe I'll go to Stanford. I'm like, that's my son. So, <laughs> that's kind of the throwaway school, you know, if you can't get into. Uh, but the reason why, <laughs> getting back to the talk, the reason why I bring it up today, I, I, two weeks ago I was in my office talking to my historians, getting in and, uh, 
in onboarding of what we do in our history office. And I told him, hey, I remember when I was a Clemson ROTC cadet, um, General Hardinger, I heard General Hardinger talk, and I can't remember what event it was, but I remember I was at Clemson. And they went and did some research, and about a month before I graduated from Clemson, General Hardinger had come to Clemson and spoken at an AFA event. And, I, and they said, I said, well, can you see if you can find that speech? And they did, which is pretty incredible. Um, and what I'd like to do is just read a little bit from that speech. So this is, quote, why did we establish a space command and why now? Our perception of space has changed. Space is a place like the land, the sea, and the air. Another uh, just another dimension. And it was just a matter of time until we started treating it as such. We had an ongoing study in the Air Force to determine when we would need an operational space command and several factors converged which led to that decision. The first reason is the Soviet threat. The Soviets have a major underlined uh, military space program. Over the past decade, they've launched four to five times as many satellites as we have, and 70% 70 70 of their launches are strictly military. They have an orbital ASAT system, which they have demonstrated for years, and which is a threat to our low orbiters. They have a solid ground-based electronic warfare system, and their high-energy laser program is three to five times the U.S. level of effort. The second reason for an operational command is our growing dependence on space systems. I can perform the missile warning mission only because I have the satellite early warning system. Our military weather satellites provide key data to all services, and over 70 percent of our long-haul communications are handled by satellites. And the global positioning system, and if you think back, this is back before it was fully populated, will let us navigate worldwide with unprecedented accuracy. With this growing military dependence on space has come an ever-increasing national security resource commitment. Ten years ago, our military space budget was $2 billion. In the FY85 budget, currently being considered in Congress, it's about $10 billion. With this resource commitment, it dictates the most effective management possible, which we can provide with an operational space command. So I, I read that whole speech. That's just an excerpt of it. And it, it really struck me. Uh, and, and the thing that uh, my first thought that came to my mind was that the challenges that we face with the birth of the command, that, that those challenges have evolved today, but they're very uh, remarkably similar to where we are today. Uh, that uncomfortable intersection of resilience and vulnerability. So when Air, Air Force Space Command was just uh, a young nine years old, we went to war in Desert Storm. The GPS constellation wasn't even fully operational at that time. Um, after, 20, after 26 years of continuous engagement, we now have integrated space to the point in the joint fight where there's absolutely nothing that we do, absolutely nothing we do in the joint, in the joint force uh, that isn't enabled by space, absolutely nothing. And, and uh, uh, I don't think General Hardinger back then probably, maybe he could, he's a pretty visionary guy, would have imagined just how integrated our space <coughs> capabilities are into everything that we do. Today, that integration of space and cyber provides us uh, absolutely mm -hmm. tremendous strategic and operational advantage, but we cannot take that advantage for granted because it's no longer a given. So today, I'm the cleanup hitter. After a year of 12 different talks, and Doug, it's great to see you. Um, so I actually read through all these 12 uh, or 11 uh, speeches that were given at breakfast over the, in, over the course of this year, and what I'm going to try to do is weave um, some common themes uh, that you heard uh, over, the, over the course of this past 11 months, and then at the end wrap up with a little bit of vectors on where we're headed. Um, probably the, the, the biggest common denominator that I pulled out of the 11 talks that I, that I read was, that, um, was the complex strategic environment that we currently face. You know, our Secretary of Defense has articulated the four plus one construct to help us uh, Get, wrap our head around that uh, and to address the current and future global security challenges. These challenges are global, they're transregional, they're multi-domain, and they're multifunctional. And if you put this another way, in my change of command talk at Air Force Space Command, when, I, when you look at that, global, transregional, multi-domain, and multifunctional, I told the Airmen of Air Force Space Command, that's, that means us. That's Air Force Space Command challenges. We operate in both space and cyber. Now, Mr. Beauchamp, uh, Congressman Bridenstine, and Mr. Lavero all touched on the growing challenges that we face in the space domain. 
They all pointed out that space was contested, congested, and competitive. Congressman Bridenstine talked about the, the space uh, renaissance, and I had actually uh, heard him, I was at a dinner with Congressman Bridenstine, and I had heard him uh, talk about the, the Space Renaissance Act, and I went home and I, I looked up in Webster's Dixon, Dictionary what, what renaissance means, you know, it, specifically in the dictionary. And if you look at it, it means uh, a, uh, a new awakening or a new beginning, an awakening or a new beginning. And I think that's a really good word for where we are in the space and the space was, and I've, and I've told the congressman that I think it's, it's a very appropriately titled act. Uh, according to OSD annual report to Congress, military and security developments involving the PRC in 2015, China's military modernization has the potential to reduce core U.S. military technological advantage. Moreover, China is investing in capabilities designed to defeat adversary power, projection, and counterintervention during a crisis or conflict. Similarly, Russia is modernizing their counterspace capability, and again, quoting, these counterspace capabilities are aimed at defeating a wide range of our space-based capabilities while seeking to secure Russian freedom of action in, through, and from the space domain. Simply put, it is not, in the not too distant future, every satellite in every orbital regime may be able to be held at risk. So if you think about that, can I grab my glass of water real quick? <coughs> Thank you. So if you think about that, I think it's important to state up front that we don't want to fight a war that extends into space. Nobody wants that, nobody wins that fight. So I think deterrence is key. And Doug Lavero, in his talk, provided a great primer on deterrence, disaggregation, diversity, distribution, deception, protection, and proliferation. As he joked, he tried to get it to be R2-D2 and <laughs> couldn't come up with R2-D2, so he came up with D4-P2. Uh, that's a policy guy for you. <clears throat> and he, I think, and Doug, don't let me uh, put words in your mouth here, but I think as he walked through the brief at the end, he really summarized that it all rolls up into deterrence, and that's really what we're talking about. As George Washington said in 1780, <clears throat> excuse me, there is nothing so likely to, to produce peace as to be well prepared to meet an enemy. And that was George Washington in 1780. We have to be ready to fight a war that extends to space. And that's what Stephen Whiting talked about when he came, and he talked about the space enterprise vision. Although, although vision is in the name, in my opinion, the SEV, space enterprise vision, is really a construct, an operational construct, um, because it allows us to execute a campaign that extends into space. The genius of the space enterprise vision, in my opinion, lies in the following. First, it's a joint Air Force and NRO construct. I think that's very, very powerful. And I will tell you that we've got a great, absolutely wonderful partner in, in Betty Sapp. I actually met with Betty right before taking command. About a week before I left the Pentagon, I went and had an office call with her. And both high on our things to talk about, on both of our, my list and her list, was the Space Enterprise vision. We've committed to keeping this a, a joint vision. We've committed to in enhancing the partnership even greater than that we have today. And I'm really excited about the possibilities of that going forward. Second, the, the Space Enterprise vision overarching goal is to deter, as, as Doug Lavero mentioned out. It's not to fight. Again, we do, not wanna, we do not wanna go down that path. The construct also provides roadmaps for each of the mission areas for achieving the vision. And finally, as the name applies, it takes an enterprise approach. It's everything from the ground infrastructure all the way up to the space segment. And that ground infrastructure, I would argue, is, might be the most important thing in the entire SEV. And that was the subject that Colonel Brian Bracey and Colonel John Antonin talked about in September when they came. <clears throat> the enterprise ground system, and you know, we're currently operating 15 uh, disparate ground systems. They're proprietary systems. They're unable to pass data to each other. They're difficult to develop and to disseminate a holistic picture of the space domain, much less multi-domain challenges. Mm -hmm. The enterprise ground system is aimed at fixing the problems our ground systems face today and will create a set, a set of government-owned standards and interfaces, exposing data to enable exploitation by uh, space enterprise applications and services, building a robust common ground platform for C2 and data sharing, and bringing enhanced situational awareness uh, to the to leaders that need that. Our, our chief of staff, General David Goldfein, uh, recently published an op-ed an op on uh, information age of warfare. 
in this article, he talked about the advantage provided uh, through the speed and integration of, of information. The, the op he went on to say in the article, operational advantage will depend on our ability to harness vast amounts of information from multiple domains, to fuse it together into decision quality information, creating simultaneous effects from all domains, and then I've added to this uh, creating multiple dilemmas um, for any potential adversary that may try to take us on. On today's information-based battlefield, a commander responsible for operations in any domain has a couple must-haves, and I've been saying this since I was the commander of JFCC Space in almost every speech I give. You have to have the ability to have awareness of the domain of which you operate in, and you have to have the ability to command and control, and again, that's taking data, fusing data, coming up with decision quality information, and I will tell you on both of those fronts today in the space and cyber business, we're not where we need to be, and we need to get there. We have to find ways to incorporate the massive volumes of data we gather into our operating systems, store, share, and compare at machine speed. Relying on human analysis alone is going to be way too slow. We need human to machine, human machine augmented intelligence to enable the decision speed required uh, to win on the battlefield of tomorrow. So now let me just kind of wrap up with where we're headed. Uh, when I took command, the day after I took command, I, I sent out a, an initial commander's intent memo would be too, too strong a word, but commander's initial guidance. And I laid out a few uh, fundamental principles that I walked into the job with, and I, I thought I'd just share those with you. First fundamental principle, and, and these really align to our chief of staffs. Um, he has three big rocks that he's working on. One, one is uh, addressing the squadron, two is developing joint leaders, and three is multi-domain operations. But in this letter, I said that Air Force Space Command will be leaders in the joint fight. Our Air Force Chief of Staff has made developing joint leaders one of his three overarching priorities. The Air Force Space Command airmen must not just be proficient in space and cyber. They also have to be proficient in air, maritime, and land. Air Force Space Command uh, airmen must have the opportunity to attend advanced schools like the School of Advanced Air and Space Power. They must be able to attend uh, weapons school. We have to be able to participate in joint exercises. We have to be able to participate in, in joint war games, and we will. And that's how we're going to work hard to develop those effective joint leaders. Air Force Space Command, the second tenant, is also going to be working to, to use a joint warfighting perspective. We're, we operate in two operational domains, the space domain and the cyber domain. And we're going to drive aggressively to implementation of the space enterprise vision, as I just uh, highlighted uh, a few moments ago. We also must uh, continue to enhance our ability to have awareness of the domain, and we have to come up with the ability to have uh, space command and control, battle management command and control, to meet the tight tactical timelines that, we're gonna, that we currently face. We're going to innovate and we're going to experiment to continue to enhance our capabilities, and our world-class acquirers will drive uh, to acquire capabilities that will improve our resiliency. Third tenet was that Air Force Space Command is a service component to U.S. Strategic Command, and we're going to be uh, good stewards of that, uh, of that role and work to be a ready and able service component uh, for General Hyten in his role as the uh, commander of U.S. Strategic Command. The fourth one was Air Force Space Command will be at the leading edge of multi-domain operations. I mentioned to you that our Chief of Staff has a big rock of, uh, uh, he calls it Big Rock 3, of, of uh, advancing the ball in multi-domain operations. All of the services are working hard to do that. And the officer that's leading that for the United States Air Force is Brigadier General Chance Saltzman, who's a space operator by trade. And we, I'm going to position, work hard to position the command to help partner with uh, Salty and help lead that effort. Because again, uh, the Airmen of Air Force Space Command operate in two of the three domains that, that uh, the Air Force operates in. We must find ways to operate seamlessly between domains and to generate effects, again, at a tempo that cannot be matched. Networked to allow superior decision speed at all levels of war, capable of seamlessly synchronizing and, and commanding and controlling forces in multiple domains and enabling multi-domain maneuver and, and a concept some have referred to as kind of domain on demand. Where do you need the effect which domain can give it to you the best and go with that domain? At Air Force Space Command, again, we, we have two-thirds uh, two of those domains, and we already have an incredible level of talent in this business. The Air Force is an Air Force that operates in airspace and cyber, and we don't just operate in stovepipe domains of airspace and cyber. We integrate operations in those three domains, and when we do, there's, we have great advantage, and when we don't, there's consequences to be had. The, the last big tenet that was in this 
the initial intent memo, memo and probably arguably the most important in my opinion is that we're going to continue to enhance our capabilities through meaningful partnerships. Um, in the space domain, we haven't, haven't had, we haven't done that as well as we needed to. Really, we haven't had to because the domain was relatively a peaceful, benign domain and we really didn't need them. That's not the case today. We cannot do this alone. When we operated in a, in a benign, relatively benign environment, these partnerships were important. Today, they're absolutely critical. We were, are going to work extremely hard to build partnerships with the intelligence community, uh, with other government agencies, with allies and foreign partners, and with civil space and, and commercial sectors, and, and with industry. And so for the industry partners that are here, I, uh, about a week or so after taking command, I sent a letter to your CEO saying, hey, I want to engage in a conversation with you. And, and uh, I look forward to that. We really, we really have to work, uh, work together. As Mr. Pochamp uh, pointed out in January, effective partnerships can further strengthen our deterrence posture as well. Our coalition partnerships have evolved from just information sharing to joint war fighting, and they provide an incredible, incredible deterrence value. We must leverage uh, the growing space capabilities of our allies. So in conclusion, today space and cyberspace are more integrated in my opinion, than General Hardinger could have ever dreamed. And that's largely based on the, the work over the last 35 years um, of our airmen. Um, space and cyber not only fuel our American way of life, they fuel our American way of war. So it's our job to make sure that this information provided in, through, and from space is always assured. It's like the light switch. When you turn on the light, the lights come on. The war fighters in the theater need to know that when the light switch comes on, that space information is always going to be there. There's a lot of hard work to do uh, to stay ahead of our advancing competitors. However, I could not be more proud of the airmen that I am privileged to lead, and I'm confident that they're going to meet these challenges head on and position us for an even greater 35 years ahead. I would also be remiss if I didn't take a moment uh, to recognize John Glenn. You know, um, it was a sad day for America yesterday, and he, the, the work that he did and the, his pioneering spirit really opened the doors for, for all of us to follow in the space business. And I think it'd be a mo it's worth a moment just to, to recognize him and to thank him and his family for all the sacrifices that they made. With that, I'm open for questions. <laughs>